Hello, I'm Professor Thompson, and this is the lecture on pathophysiology, part one. Okay, and don't let pathophysiology scare you. Uh, it, it's a little bit different from anatomy and physiology. Anatomy and physiology is the study of uh, the normal function of the body and the normal uh, different parts of the body, uh, if you will, where pathophysiology is a study of organisms in the presence of disease. All right. Uh, biology is a study of living organisms with regard to the origin, growth, structure, behavior, and reproduction. And that's where anatomy and physiology kind of live. Uh, where pathophysiology is the study with altered functioning and th it's in the presence of disease. And I think it's actually more interesting because you see uh, how the body reacts to disease and injury and illness. And that kind of gives you, as a clinician, why we do what we do. Um, and the, the medications we give, the treatments we perform... It's all related to the pathophysiology of the body, and, and it gives you a really deep understanding of why you do what you do. Um, the word pathophysiology is derived from the Greek words pathos, meaning suffering, and uh, physis, meaning form. Okay, so that's where you get pathophysiology. Uh, when the structure and function in cells, tissues, and organs break down in response to stressors, uh, and the body can no longer maintain homeostasis, uh, disease may result. And that, that's what we're studying. And then to understand the disease process, you, you must understand the way uh, a disease alters the structure and the function in the cells. So that's what we're going to sort of get into with this pathophysiology module. All right, let's talk about adaptions in cells and tissues. When exposed to adverse conditions, cells undergo an adaptation uh, process to attempt to protect themselves from injury. Change can be permanent or temporary. Atrophy, as you probably are familiar with, is a de decrease in the cell size due to loss of subcellular components. And so not the amount of cells, but the size of those cells, they'll start to get smaller. All right. Uh, the actual number of the cells remains unchanged. Decreased size uh, represents an attempt to cope with the new steady state uh, with less than favorable conditions or lack of use. So muscular uh, atrophy is probably the most common one that people would recognize. It occurs, uh, think of somebody that's bedridden. Um, it occurs when somebody becomes uh, paraplegic or quadriplegic. Those muscles don't get used and they'll start to atrophy and they become smaller. Hypertrophy is the opposite. It's an increase in size of cells due to the synthesis of more subcellular components. Okay, so when the cell needs to be used more, uh, the size of that cell uh, will increase, not the number. Again, hypertrophy is not the number. So atrophy and hypertrophy are strictly related to the size of the cell. Okay, and then you have hyperplasia. Now that's where you get an increase in the actual number of the cells, and that could be due to cancer. Uh, the early stages of cancer include hyperplasia. Uh, in fact, a lot of cancers have to do with um, the inability to control the increase in the number of cells. Okay, so the hyperplasia has to do with a number. And then dysplasia is an alteration in the size, shape, and or the organization of the cells. It's most often found in epithelial cells that have undergone irregular atypical changes. Okay, um, and, and one form of dysplasia would be if somebody was an alcoholic. It can happen to the esophagus because of the pH of the alcohol um, that's constantly going down. Or somebody that has GERD. Uh, you have a lot of stomach acid coming up in the esophagus, right? Because of a poor sphincter tone. And the actual lining of the esophagus, that's epithelial tissue, it will change uh, based on the pH that it's being presented. We know that this happens in the lining of the lungs, right? Of the, of the bronchus, bronchioles, when somebody smokes. Um, so that's dysplasia, a change in the size, shape, or the organization of cells. And then metaplasia is reversible cellular adaptation uh, in which one adult cell type is replaced by another cell type. All right, let's talk about disturbances in fluid balance. The human body is uh, composed primarily of water, of course, we all know that. All biochemical reactions taking place within the body are occurring in an aqueous environment. 
Changes in fluid and electrolyte uh, balance that disrupt homeostasis can either cause or exacerbate various disease processes. Uh, homeostasis can be upset in a number of ways, such as by excessive output or input of fluids. Uh, you could have profuse sweating, excessive salt intake, uh, dehydration, uh, a person deprived of water for three days or more may die. Uh, you know, so all these things cause disturbances in fluid balance and upset homeostasis. The degree of fluid imbalance uh, required to compromise homeostasis and cause illness depends on the patient's size, age, and underlying medical conditions. In healthy adults, loss of more than 30% of total body fluid is required uh, to, to upset homeostasis, so 30% is a lot of fluid. Uh, in a small child, a loss of only 10 to 15% of total body fluid could produce symptoms uh, of shock. And fluid therapy is a fundamental step in resuscitation. We know that. Um, and, and we can talk a little bit about that and how it relates to hypovolemic shock. So if somebody's losing blood volume, uh, we do want to uh, administer fluids in most cases. But the amount of fluids and the urgency of the fluids is, is related to the patient's blood pressure. If they're perfusing, so I like to say if they have a MAP of greater than 65, a mean arterial pressure greater than 65, you want to be very conservative with the amount of fluids you give. The old two large bore IVs, fluids wide open, is, is over. We don't do that anymore in hypovolemic shock. And the reason is because we're not giving them blood. We're giving them salt water, basically. You're either giving Ringer's lactate, you may be giving plasma light, uh, but you're probably giving sodium chloride or, or Ringer's lactate. And those medic medications don't include... Um, coagulant properties, you know, so you, you, they don't have the ability to cause a blood clot and they don't carry oxygen. There's no hemoglobin. There's no blood cells. Uh, they don't fight infection. So those fluids are strictly there for increasing the volume and it makes the blood less viscous as well. And the problem with that is you could increase the amount of bleeding. So when there's no platelets uh, you're, or you're washing out the platelets, you could increase the amount of bleeding. Increasing the pressure you know, it, it could increase the amount of bleeding uh, by, you know, just relatively increasing that hydrostatic pressure is going to push more blood out. So you may want to maintain a relative hypoperfused state or relative hypotension. So another disturbance in fluid uh, balance could be too much fluid. Uh, edema is an excessive amount of fluid in the interstitial space, may have several causes, Increased capillary hydrostatic pressure from uh, arterial uh, dilation, so uh, dilation of the arteries. Venous obstruction, okay, could cause edema. Increased vascular volume is a given. Increased level of adrenocortical uh, hormones could cause edema. Premenstrual sodium retention, all right, pregnancy. Anytime you, you maintain sodium, you're going to maintain fluid. Wherever salt goes, water follows. Uh, environmental stress, effects of gravity from prolonged standing could cause edema. Uh, decreased colloidal osmotic pressure in the capillaries uh, could also cause edema from decreased production of plasma proteins or increased loss of plasma proteins. So plasma proteins pull fluid, right? Large molecules pull fluid, just like salt. And if you don't have uh, a, a, enough of that to, to kind of keep them and maintain a colloidal osmotic pressure, then the fluid's going to shift into where it shouldn't be. Uh, lymphatic vessel obstruction due to an infection uh, could cause uh, a, a, an increase in edema. Lymphatic disease or removal of lymphatic structures uh, could cause edema as well. So, uh, severe edema may be caused by long-standing lymphatic obstruction. Peripheral edema, ankles and feet is the common form. Uh, sacral edema may occur in, in our bedridden patients. Uh, ascites is the abnormal accumulation of fluid in the peritoneal cavity, also a type of edema. I, I always say ascites is the Greek goddess of fluid in the belly, and that's how you remember that. So your clinical manifestations uh, may be local or generalized, and then pulmonary edema, that's the, the scary one that we want to get moving on the airway and ventilation. Uh, pulmonary edema patients with cardiac disease, or following submersion, uh, narcotic overdose, or high-altitude pulmonary edema, 
Uh, there's many different causes. The most common one that we see is CHF, of course. All right, since we're talking about edema, I thought it important to talk about filtration and absorption. All right, filtration and absorption. And so what we're talking about is at the level of the capillary. We have the arterial side here on the left and the venual side here on the right. And this is the capillary or mid-capillary in the middle. And what, what you're either going to have is filtration where fluid and, and waste stuff moves outside of the vessel or absorption where waste comes back into the vessel to be eliminated from the body. So uh, filtration occurs, and I said uh, waste, but really it's good stuff. So you're sending uh, all you know the nutrients, oxygen and stuff out to the tissues of the body on the arterial side. And the reason it's exiting is because you have a plus 10 uh, net filtration pressure. And how do you get that? Well, inside, the hydrostatic pressure is inside this blood vessel. Okay, so inside the blood vessel, you have a hydrostatic pressure of 35 millimeters of mercury. 35 millimeters of mercury in here on the arterial side. Okay, and out here, you have a constant pressure, all right, of 25, let's say 25 millimeters of mercury out in the extravascular space or the interstitial space. This is called your blood colloidal osmotic pressure. So your osmotic pressure is constant. All right. So if it's 35 here and it's 25 out here, obviously things are going to filter. You're, they're going to leave the vessel. And then we don't have any movement here at, at the mid capillary because the hydrostatic pressure here is also 25, 25 millimeters of mercury. So there's no change. And then over here on the venual side, on the venous side, you have a uh, net change or net filtration of negative 7 millimeters of mercury, meaning that the hydrostatic pressure on the venual side is 18 millimeters of mercury, and that's less than the colloidal pressure of 25, so things are going to move back in, and that's what's supposed to happen. You're supposed to eliminate wastes, and, and that's what happens. Now let's talk about somebody that has CHF, congestive heart failure. They present to you with very high blood pressures, right? So if they've got a blood pressure of 220, uh, they're pressure at the capillary, all right, may be, let's say, 55, 65 on, on this arterial side, okay? So let's say it's 65 on the arterial side. Obviously, it's higher than this constant colloidal pressure, so you're going to get filtration, which is normal. You're going to get filtration, maybe a little bit more filtration than normal because of such a high hydrostatic pressure. Then, it's not going to drop much over here in the mid capillary area and you're going to have let's say a 55 is going to be your hydrostatic pressure here well the problem is now you still have filtration okay and then over here on this venual side it's still going to be too high and let's say it's 35 35 and now it's instead of absorbing it's filtering and that can happen with fluid, and that's how you end up with edema. Fluid is moving from inside the vessel to outside the vessel, okay? There's many other ways you get edema, like th there's gaps that get created here in the, in the tissues, the epithelial tissues of the, of the blood vessel when you have infection or inflammation. But this uh, change in hydrostatic pressure is a very common cause of edema, and especially in your, in your congestive heart failure patients, your hypertension patients. So let's talk about uh, assessment and management of your uh, patient with edema. Uh, must perform an in-depth assessment, okay? And you want to include auscultation of lung sounds, of course, evaluation for pedal or sacral edema, and jugular venous distension. All of those will indicate uh, give you indications of the fluid imbalance uh, and their perfusion status. Electrocardiogram, so you want to get an EKG and get some vital signs on those patients as well. Determine a patient's medical history and their current and past medications. That can clue you in on the, if they're a chronic lunger, a chf -er, if this is new for them, if they have renal failure. Treatment dictated by the patient's chief complaint presenting problem and may include a CPAP. Obviously, CPAP helps with uh, displacing some of that fluid that's in the lungs and pushing the, your, the, your ventilation past uh, that, that increase in hydrostatic pressure into those capillaries uh, through adding uh, 
PEEP, positive end expiratory pressure, which is very helpful uh, in maintaining uh, open alveolus and, and pushing oxygen into the, into the body or air into the body. Uh, supplemental oxygen, of course. Uh, positional therapy may be needed. So if you have somebody with pulmonary edema, sit them up because if they're supine, then a, a small amount of edema will affect all of the lobes of the lungs. If you have them sitting upright and they have a minimal amount of edema, now it's only affecting the bases of the lungs. Nitrates are very important because by opening up the, uh, dilating the arteries, you're going to help reduce the preload and the afterload and allow uh, blood to move better throughout the body, throughout the heart. And diuretics, of course, uh, they're not given as much emergently, uh, especially pre-hospitally, because they take a little while to work, um, and they help get rid of some of the volume if the patient is, in fact, volume overloaded. So talking about uh, disturbances in fluid balance, you could have an isotonic fluid deficit. Uh, and that's a decrease in extracellular fluid with a proportionate loss of sodium and water. So that's normal. Uh, the, you're, you're losing volume, but you're also losing the sodium with the water, not just water and maintaining sodium. Uh, the most common form of fluid loss is an isotonic, isotonic fluid deficit. And often uh, it's the result of sweating, excessive sweating or combining an increased physical exertion with other comorbidities may complicate the fluid loss and cause additional problems. An isoton isotonic fluid excess, okay, isotonic fluid excess is a proportionate increase in both sodium and water in the extracellular fluid compartment. Causes include kidney, heart, and liver failure. Um, obviously, that causes an increase in fluid. And manifestations of conditions depend on the serum sodium level. When dehydration exists, orthostatic hypotension and decreased urine output oliguria are common. All right, uh, they're, they're dehydrated. They're not going to urinate as much. And we know that dehydration will cause a change in your orthostatic vital signs. So performing a tilt test on these patients is, is very good in helping determine what's going on with them. And then when sodium level is very high, delirium and coma may be seen. Okay, so if you get too, too much of an isotonic fluid excess, the patient may actually become hypernatremic, hypernatremic, and that's pretty bad, and cause uh, delirium and even coma. All right, let's talk a little bit more about electrolyte imbalances. And the first one we're going to talk about is sodium, which we've already mentioned a little bit about. You don't need to remember the normal level, but the normal level is 136 to 144 milliequivalents per liter. The reason you don't need to remember the normal level is because anytime you get a lab value, it's going to have the normal range on there. And if they're without, or if they're outside of that normal range, uh, it's going to show the number in a different color, usually red. Uh, so sodium is an element essential to the body that is found primarily in the blood and fluid outside of the cells. Uh, the functions are it regulates fluid balance, total fluid volume, and blood pressure by controlling the movement of water across cellular membranes. Remember where sodium goes, water follows. It facilitates muscle contraction and nerve impulse transmission. So hyponatremia can cause uh, problems with nerve impulse transmission and people may actually end up with symptoms that look like multiple sclerosis or, or something like that and, and it's really a bad thing. Abnormal sodium levels may result in nausea, seizures, and cardiac dysrhythmias. Uh, any electrolyte imbalance can cause cardiac dysrhythmia, so keep that in mind. Uh, again, you don't need to remember what the normal serum levels are, but know that if they're outside the normal, they can have deficits uh, such as a hypertonic fluid deficit. It's caused by excessive body water loss without a proportionate sodium loss. So you're not adding sodium, but they become hypernatremic because the concentration of sodium goes up when you lose water, but you don't lose sodium. So if you were to uh, urinate and only water came out and you retained sodium, which isn't going to normally happen, then somehow that would cause a hypernatremia because of the concentration of sodium within the blood. Uh, consequently, hypotonic fluid deficit, so hypotonic, not hypertonic, uh, is when sodium loss in the, is, occurs without a proportionate loss of water. So you're losing sodium, or your concentration of sodium goes down, but your, the amount of water goes up. 
So the blood becomes hypotonic. Remember, blood is hypertonic when it's got more molecules than water. So sodium, in this case, if they're hypernatremic, they'd be hypertonic. And if they're hyponatremic, they'd be hypotonic. Okay, and the causes of hyponatremia uh, include excessive sweating in the heat during exercise, vomiting, diarrhea, or inappropriate use of IV fluids or diuretics. Some patients experience nausea, headaches, seizures, and or coma. It's pretty dangerous. Clinical findings typically depend uh, not only on the absolute sodium level, but also on when the abno uh, abnormality developed. People who develop the abnormality acutely have more symptoms than people who develop symptoms over a period of days. Um, and one of the causes of this uh, that was kind of mainstream for a while, years ago, uh, college students used to have a water drinking challenge where they would chug gallons of water. And what that does is displaces sodium. You have too much water, not enough sodium. So that means they're hyponatremic and hy they would end up having seizures and become very ill uh, from the low sodium content or concentration in their serum potassium or serum uh, blood level. All right, we have two more electrolytes to talk about uh, when it comes to electrolyte imbalances, potassium and calcium. Potass potassium is the major intracellular cation, uh, is crucial to many cellular functions such as neuromuscular control, regulation of three types of muscles, regulation of the acid-base balance, facilitation of intracellular enzyme reactions, maintenance of intracellular osmolarity, uh, you don't need to memorize, it, again, this uh, serum potassium level, but the normal range is 3.5 to 5 milliequivalents per liter. And if you go below that, you can have hypokalemia. Hypokalemia is a decreased serum potassium level. And the common cause of this are, uh, obviously, a decreased potassium intake because you do get it through diet. Uh, potassium shifts into the cells. So if, if your potassium moves from extracellular to intracellular, you can have a decreased serum potassium level. Also, you could have a renal potassium losses through urination. Uh, in, in fact, that's one of the main ways we eliminate potassium. And external potassium losses, or extra renal potassium losses, excuse me. Uh, frequent symptoms of hypokalemia include muscular weakness, because again, it's, it's part of neuromuscular control. Um, fatigue, muscle cramps, flaccid paralysis, uh, hyporeflexia and tetany can even occur, and it can be treated with IV potassium supplementation, but that's not really done pre-hospitally. That's more done uh, in the emergency room or even in, in the uh, ICU. Hyperkalemia is an elevated serum potassium level. So on the opposite end of the spectrum, you have hyperkalemia, and that's pretty dangerous as well. Common uh, causes you may see in the pre-hospital setting include decreased excretion from renal failure. That's probably the most common cause. Somebody has renal failure so that they don't urinate, so they don't eliminate potassium, and their serum potassium level goes way up. Shifts of potassium from within the cell could occur, such as from burns, crush injuries, metabolic acidosis, and insulin deficiency. Excessive dietary intake of potassium. You could actually eat too many bananas and, or, and potassium supplementation. Uh, chlorcon is a potassium supplement, and if you took too much of it, you could cause hyperkalemia. And it interferes with normal neuromuscular function. It may lead to muscular weakness and flaccid paralysis. And it's impossible to diagnose an electrolyte imbalance uh, based entirely on your cardiac monitor findings. But there are EKG findings that, that do occur. And hyperkalemia can cause severe dysrhythmias. Calcium, uh, it's majority, 98% of it is actually found in bone and teeth. Uh, but it provides strength and stability for the collagen and ground substances forming the matrix of the skeletal system. So it's very important when it comes to bone and teeth uh, and the skeletal system. It enters the body uh, through the GI tract. It's absorbed from the intestines in a process that depends on the presence of vitamin D. So we know that vitamin D deficiency can cause a calcium deficiency. Uh, and we know we get it uh, through dietary uh, through our uh, uh, nutritional su supplementation. Uh, calcium is stored in bone tissue and ultimately excreted by the kidneys, just like pot uh, potassium is excreted. Normal serum calcium level is 8.2 to 10.2. Again, you don't have to memorize that. Hypocalcemia uh, is a decreased serum calcium level, of course, and it's caused by decreased intake or absorption, uh, as in malabsorption of vitamin D deficiency, like we talked about. Uh, increased loss, such as th through alcoholism uh, and diuretic therapy. Uh, you could have an endocrine disease, such as hypoparathyroidism. That can cause hypocalcemia. 
sepsis is another cause. Uh, signs and symptoms include skeletal muscle spasms causing cramps and tetany, laryngeal spasms, seizures, abnormal sensations, paresthesias of the lips and extremities, uh, and you could have prolongation of the QT interval on an EKG and the development of cardiac dysrhythmias, just like uh, hyperkalemia can cause, may be observed uh, on the EKG. And consequently, uh, hypocalcemia okay, and hyperkalemia kind of go together, and one of the treatments for hyperkalemia is calcium. It's, so they work uh, kind of opposite of each other. Hypercalcemia, so too much calcium, it could occur. It's an increased serum calcium level, and it's caused by increased intake or absorption, such as with excess antacid ingestion. So antacids uh, in, in, include uh, calcium. So if you were to take and eat a lot of antacids, you could have hypercalcemia. Uh, endocrine disorders such as primary hyperparathyroidism and adrenal insufficiency such as with Addison's disease. Uh, neoplasms or cancers uh, could cause uh, hypercalcemia. Uh, bone cancer, of course, is the one that, that we're talking about. Uh, uh, miscellaneous causes such as diuretics and uh, sarcoidosis can cause uh, an increase in calcium and the serum uh, calcium levels. Signs and symptoms of hypercalcemia include fatigue, weakness, nausea, constipation, frequent urination. So it's not as bad as low calcium, but of course anything in excess cannot be good. Uh, treatment depends on addressing the underlying cause. So volume replacement with boluses of 0.45% or 0.9% sodium chloride solution may be helpful. So your, your normal saline, uh, remember the, the solution to pollution is dilution and hypercalcemia is of course a type of pollution. Two more electrolytes, phosphate and magnesium. Phosphate is an intracellular anion, anion, so negative, uh, essential to many functions. A hypophosphatemia is a decrease in serum, serum phosphate levels. It's caused by decreased supply or absorption, as can occur in starvation, malabsorption, or blocked absorption, such as with aluminum-containing antacids. Excessive loss of phosphate is associated with use of diuretics or in patients with hyperparathyroidism, hyperthyroidism, or alcohol. Uh, you could have intracellular shift of phosphorus. That can always occur, such as after administering glucose, anabolic steroids, or oral contraceptives, or in patients with respiratory alkalosis or salicylate poisoning, like aspirin. Uh, electrolyte abnormalities such as hypercalcemia and hypomagnesemia uh, could cause a, a decrease in your serum phosphate levels as well and abnormal loss of nutrients followed by inadequate replenishment as can occur in patients with diabetic ketoacidosis or chronic alcoholism. Signs and symptoms of your hypophosphatemia uh, include dysrhythmias. Remember, any electrolyte imbalance can cause dysrhythmias. Hypotension, uh, muscle weakness, altered mental status, breakdown of muscle fibers, rhabdomyolysis. Okay, that, that's another symptom of a decrease in phosphate, and seizures, acute blood disorders, and increased uh, susceptibility to infection uh, may be seen in acute cases. Treatment involves oral replenishment in mild to moderate cases. Severe cases and symptomatic patients will require hospital IV phosphate replacement. Okay, and Most of your electrolyte imbalances are going to be fixed at the hospital, if not all of them. Hyperphosphatemia okay, is an increase in phosphate levels, and that's caused by massive loading of phosphate into the extracellular fluid, excessive use of vitamin D, laxatives, or enzymes containing phosphate, IV phosphate supplements, chemotherapy can cause it, metabolic acidosis. Uh, it results in acromegaly, okay, acromegaly. Uh, and signs and symptoms include tremors, uh, a paresthesia, hyperreflexia, confusion, seizures, muscle weakness, decreased mental status, coma, hypotension, heart failure, prolonged QT interval, a bunch of bad stuff. The normal range of, of serum phosphate is 2.3 to 4.7. Again, you don't need to remember that. Uh, magnesium. Uh, it's the second most abundant intracellular cation, magnesium. Normal range of serum magnesium is 1.3 to 2.1. Hypomagnesemia is decreased serum magnesium level. A decreased serum magnesium level is hypomagnesemia, uh, and that's kind of a given. It's caused by diminished magnesium absorption or intake. Uh, 
as occurs with malabsorption, chronic diarrhea, laxative abuse, or malnutrition. You're seeing a common theme here, right? Uh, increased renal loss of magnesium could occur when you use diuretics or, or you have too much aldosterone uh, or hypercalcemia could even cause it and volume expansion as well. Miscellaneous causes such as diabetes or respiratory alkalosis and pregnancy can also cause a decrease in magnesium. And it presents with weakness, muscle cramps, neuromuscular and central nervous system, uh, hyper irritability with tremors and, and jerking, uh, hypertension, tachycardia, ventricular dysrhythmias, uh, confusion and disorientation. Now on the opposite end of the spectrum, when you have hypermagnesemia and you have an increase in your serum, serum magnesium level, uh, it results from kidney insufficiency and the inability to excrete the amount of magnesium taken in and the symptoms include muscle weakness, decreased tendon reflexes, alter mental status, weakness, respiratory uh, muscle paralysis, which is bad, right? Uh, apnea, and then cardiac arrest, of course, uh, can, can occur if you have too much magnesium. All right, let's move on from electrolyte disturbances to the disturbances of the acid-base balance. There are a lot of parallels between the two. Um, so pH represents the concentration of hydrogen ions in a solution. Uh, it's a measure of the acidity or alkalinity of a solution. So hydrogen is an acid. Uh, there is an inverse relationship between pH and hydrogen ion concentration. The lower the pH, the higher the acidity. All right, disturbances of acid-base balance. Acids and bases uh, neutral, neutralize each other uh, and must retain re a balance, okay? So acid and base are opposite of each other. Every patient complaint you encounter as a paramedic will have this component to some degree. Uh, acidosis is an increase in extracellular hydrogen ions. Alkalosis is a decrease in extracellular hydrogen ions. Extracellular outside the cell, inside the blood, the amount of hydrogen is what determines whether they're acidotic or alkalotic. Disturbances of acid-base balance are associated with disturbances in potassium balance. Kidney transport systems move hydrogen and potassium in opposite directions. So acidosis excretes hydrogen and reabsorbs uh, potassium, where Alkalosis excretes potassium and reabsorbs hydrogen. Uh, calcium, calcium ions uh, sh also shift out of the cell in response to the influx of hydrogen. So, again, like I said, there's a lot of parallels with electrolyte disturbances and acid-base disturbances. So, so talk about uh, the different types of acid-base imbalances. Uh, you can have fluctuations in pH due to bicarbonate levels uh, that result in metabolic acidosis or alkalosis. So when we're talking about bar bicarbonate levels, you're talking about metabolic acidosis or metabolic alkalosis. Fluctuations in pH due to respiratory disorders result in respiratory acidosis or respiratory alkalosis, and that usually has to do with CO2. Okay, so Z CO2 would be your or carbon dioxide would be your respiratory alkalosis or acidosis and bicarbonate would be your metabolic. When you get your blood gases, that's what you're looking at. Uh, when an acid-base disorder is not immediately correctable by the body's buffering system, the body initiates compensatory mechanisms to try to correct that. So let's first talk about respiratory acidosis. Uh, it's usually related to hypoventilation, okay? Um, its compensatory mechanism is the renal buffer system. It causes include airway obstruction, cardiac arrest, overdoses of CNS depressant drugs, you know, like heroin, uh, submersion, uh, respiratory arrest, pulmonary edema, closed head injury. You know, uh, when you get that Cushing's reflex, you get a decrease in respirations. All right, uh, chest trauma could cause a decrease in respirations, and carbon monoxide poisoning could cause respiratory acidosis. Uh, hypoventilation can quickly develop a potentially fatal acidosis, making it impossible for the slow reacting renal system to compensate. Okay, so it, if you're hypoventilating or if patients hypoventilating, they can quickly die. That's what that's telling us. Uh, signs and symptoms include systemic or cerebral vasodilation, or both, uh, headaches, lightheadedness, warm, flushed skin, CNS depression, bradypnea, 
which is a slow respiratory rate, nausea, and vomiting. A chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, or COPD, creates a respiratory acidosis over time. And we want to use capnography as one of our tools to help us identify this. Um, when you have a patient that's hypoventilating, um, especially if they're bradypneic, they'll eventually develop really elevated entitled CO2 or capnography, and it's going to be greater than, let's see that line, let's say that line is at 45, okay, um, and it's going to be greater than that, and you're going to see entitled CO2s in excess of that, um, and usually uh, the waveform is slower because they're not ventilating as fast, they have bradypnea. They could be hypoventilating because they're breathing uh, too fast, but too shallow as well, um, could be a type of hypoventilation. This figure just shows you the types of acid-base balances uh, or imbalances. Uh, over here, okay, you have an increase in carbonic acid due to, okay, a respiratory acidosis, which we know is caused by uh, a hypoventilation. So you don't ventilate well, you maintain a higher level of CO2, which becomes carbonic acid, which creates an overall acidosis. So we have a respiratory acidosis, and we've moved this way on the pH scale. So our pH has gone down, 7.0. And your body tries to formate, uh, formulate some additional bicarbonate, and it adds it to the normal amount of bicarbonate and kind of balance that out. Now, eventually, it's not going to be able to do that. Your metabolic acidosis or alkalosis isn't going to be able to keep up with the respiratory uh, acidosis. Next we have respiratory alkalosis because you're blowing off too much CO2. So this would be a hyperventilating patient or somebody that's got tachypnea. It's associated with conditions that result in hyperventilation. Carbon dioxide levels drop in the blood forcing a reduction in circulating carbonic acid which we were just talking about, the renal system begins to retain hydrogen ions. So your metabolic uh, system is trying to maintain or create a metabolic acidosis because of the respiratory alkalosis. Um, calcium shifts into the intracellular fluid to rebalance the depleted hydrogen levels. Uh, the resulting hypocalcemia causes muscle contractions. All right, and you see that with your hyperventilating patient, a classic sign of respiratory alkalosis is hyperventilation accompanied by carpopedal spasms. And a lot of people think that that has to do with potassium shift. It actually has to do with a calcium shift. It's calcium uh, trying to make up for the hydrogen loss. Its causes of hyperventilation and respiratory alkalosis include drug overdose, especially aspirin, fever, uh, and overzealous bag mask ventilation could, uh, of course, cause a respiratory alkalosis. Signs and symptoms include diminished level of consciousness, lightheadedness, carpopedal spasms, paresthesias of the lips and face, uh, and that's kind of like that tingling sensation, uh, chest tightness, confusion, vertigo, blurred vision, nausea, vomiting, and eventually sometimes syncope as well, or loss of consciousness. Um, and then, again, use your capnography, and on this patient, you're going to see very fast plateaus that, that are lower than the normal range. All right, so your, your capnometer might give you a number of, let's say, 30, okay, which is below 35, and that's going to indicate, uh, it's going to indicate a hypocapnia, which could be due to uh, hyperventilation, which would cause respiratory alkalosis. So we actually see the decrease in CO2 here. All right, now let's talk about metabolic, and it, metabolic acidosis is any acidosis not related to the respiratory system. All right, increased respiration is the compensatory mechanism for this condition because you're going to try to have a respiratory alkalosis to fix the metabolic acidosis, so there'll be tachypnic. Uh, and kind of the hallmark one that I can think of telling you about is DKA from hyperkalemia. Diabetic ketoacidosis is a metabolic acidosis, and it often presents with Kussmaul's respirations, which are going to be fast, deep ventilations. All right, hydrogen uh, leaks into the cell and serum potassium shifts into the extracellular space, raising the serum potassium level and putting the patient at risk of dysrhythmia because of hyperkalemia. All right, so metabolic acidosis can actually cause a hyperkalemia. Uh, calcium also shifts into the uh, extracellular space, causing hypercalcemia, uh, which obstructs impulses to neurons and muscles and other tissues. Uh, causes include lactic acidosis, 
caused by anaerobic cellular respiration. Ketoacidosis, which is what we talked about, can also cause metabolic acidosis. Uh, aspirin overdose, because aspirin is an acid. Alcohol ingestion leading to alcoholic ketoacidosis. Gastrointestinal losses, which can uh, precipitate metabolic acidosis. Uh, the clinical presentation of metabolic acidosis is similar to that of a respiratory acidosis. And it includes vasodilation, CNS depression, headaches, warm flush skin, tachypnea, uh, nausea and vomiting, and even cardiac dysrhythmias. And finally, we have metabolic alkalosis. Metabolic alkalosis occurs when there is an excessive loss of acid from the increased urine output or decreased gastric acid level in the stomach, common among chronically ill patients. Several factors associated with upper GI losses can lead to metabolic alkalosis, such as excessive vomiting, drinking large amounts of water during vigorous exercise, nasogastric suctioning, suctioning excessive intake of alkaline substances such as antacids, very common, or similar alkaline substances. A uh, compensatory mechanism is the respiratory system. So bradypnea may develop to correct the diminished hydrogen ion levels, increasing the level of circulating acid. Uh, acid. And that's going to be what you're going to think of treating is you're going to see the patient is hypoventilating their bradypneic. And what that's actually trying to do is treat an underlying metabolic alkalosis. So the, the patient is compensating, but we're going to go in there thinking we have to ventilate them. Uh, signs and symptoms include confusion, muscle tremors, uh, and cramps, bradypnea, and hypotension. So uh, keep that in mind that the actual bradypnea may be caused by a metabolic alkalosis, a metabolic alkalosis. And that's going to bring us to the end of part one of pathophysiology, okay? I have not gone over everything there is to know about acid-base balance. Uh, you could certainly watch many of the uh, different videos that I put uh, in the module. There are seven MedCram videos specifically about acid-base uh, balances. There's way more information in there than you need to know or retain, but um, it, it's going to include everything you should know as well. So definitely watch those videos and, and try to learn more about acid-base balance because it is going to be a part of almost every patient you come in contact with.